Good evening, class. On um, today's section, or this week's section, we're going to go over federalism and civil liberties. Of course, we discussed the Constitution last time, and one of the major factors in the Constitution is the idea of separation of powers, and part of that is federalism, which is the division of powers and functions between two levels of government, so a national government and a state government. This is part of the separation of powers, which divides each level of government against itself by giving the branches or levels separate functions, capabilities, forcing them to do what? They got to share power. They have to work together. One can't operate without the other. So these are institutional features that limit the power of our government, um, specifically the federal government, national government. Um, you know, by dividing it amongst itself. You know, one can't do without the other's approval and many times vice versa. So James Madison, you know, the main father of the Constitution and this concept of of the American Federalist system have the saying of uh, auxiliary precautions. A dependence on the people is no doubt the primary control on the government. But, so we want a government of the people, right? Democrat, democracy. But experience has taught mankind in the necessity of auxiliary precautions. And that's the idea of these precautions, meaning let's separate the government, let's make checks and balances to protect against um, mankind making decisions that come bring back to tyranny, um, especially the tyranny of the majority, where a majority of the populace takes away the rights of the minority. So the idea is federalism separation of powers will, will keep this from happening. Your text um, talks about four stages of federalism and about how pretty much it's the federal federal government has grown in power um, compared to the state governments. And at the beginning, pretty much for most of American history, from our founding and the Constitution's ratification to the New Deal, the Great Depression period um, with Franklin Delano Roosevelt presidency, that until this time period, that the national government is very small. Its powers are limited. The most effects of citizens are have to do with their state and local governments. This was referred to as a layer cake. If you have the national government on top and the state government on the bottom, but they're not mixing each layer. Then going back to the FDR New Deal, this is a period where the federal government becomes much larger, makes many more laws that will encroach on the state governments, and there'll be much more of a blend between the federal government and the state governments. A lot of this has to do with funds, with money from the federal government going to the state governments, known as grants and aid. And here we're becoming more what you might say a marble cake, Marble cake, is, of course, is, is a mix, like the batter is mixed, the different flavors, the chocolate, the vanilla um, is mixed. And now we have the federal and state government. They're more blended. They are going to have more cooperation, more connections to each other. And as you can see here with this chart going over the grants and aid, pretty much money from the federal government given to the state governments, you can see its dramatic rise in billions of dollars, and now it's in the over over 500, about billion dollars every year goes from the federal government to the state governments for them to, to use. Now, how they use this brings us to how the state governments use this federal money. It goes to regulated federalism of the 1960s, pretty much to today. This here is where the federal government just doesn't hand out the money to the states and they do with it what they want. No, they have to use it for certain things. Uh, either you have to use it for this building this road or highway, or you have to use some money for Medicaid, you know, health insurance for the poor, um, lots of other mandates. Or we'll give you money to your local state schools, universities, but they have to do this curriculum or they can't do that. So there's more mandates, you know, strings attached, right? Federal government's not just giving this money away for the states without asking for anything in return. 
it be, the federal federalism was becoming so strong that the federal government was able to do unfunded mandates where they pretty much pass a law or do an executive action from a department that says, you know, hey, all states must comply with this order and there's no funds that go with it. It's just we have to now follow this Environmental Protection Agency rule or this rule from the Interior Department. These are called unfunded mandates. Now, your text talks about a new federalism that says, you know, tries to describe that state governments are starting to get or get more power back. Um, and you can see this in some ways, but um, with block grants, this is kind of without strings attached. Hey, here's some money. We want you to use it for this, but you guys decide best how to do it. You could think of welfare reform in the 90s, trying to give states more choices what to do with the funds. But still, you should know that it was still in the marble cake where the states and federal government are much more intertwined. And here you can see this. I want you to concentrate on the orange line here. This is a percentage of state and local budgets that's provided by the federal government. So we're talking in the low 30%. So just think of California's state budget. We get a lot from the federal government, and that plays a part in our politics and what we do with the money and our budget. So let's go over some examples of federalism. We all know that when a disaster hits, sometimes you hear the president speak, and then they announce the the president or the federal government has said this is an official disaster area, and they release certain money and People who work for federal emergency, FEMA, people are gonna from the federal government are gonna come and help. Sometimes this divulges into a bit of a blame game if things don't go well, as I think we've seen with the recent Puerto Rico hurricane, the one in Puerto Rico, and uh, in Katrina back in uh, 2005, um, where the federal government and the state and local governments um, are struggling to coordinate. Think of governors, mayors, local police, federal, you know, military coming in to assist. Um, sometimes their things aren't going great and there's a bit of a blame game. Another example is the recent uh, Affordable Care Act, Obamacare Medicaid expansion. Affordable Care Act said that um, state governments would have to expand the Medicaid program. Medicaid is a state uh, monitored, uh, facilitated program. And th this law said the federal government will give you more money for Medicaid, but you have to expand it to this level of the poverty line and such. Um, several state attorneys, uh, you know, argued that this was against, uh, this was too much federal encroachment. You can't force a state to do, change this policy. And uh, in the Supreme Court, it was ruled that the federal government cannot force um, the states to change the Medicaid policies. This, of course, would mean that they do not get the federal dollars, though. Another example is ethanol, corn farmers. This is a little different. This is where you have certain states. Think of Iowa, where there are um, subsidies where the federal government pays people to use their corn for ethanol. And there's lots of problems with that. It ends up costing more energy to produce than it saves. And um, it's kind of seen as a political handout, but... These politicians in Iowa, uh, it's very important for them. They get the money. They fight hard for it. Other people in other districts and states don't care as much, but the Iowa people care enough to really push it, and these ethanol subsidies from the federal government keep coming in, even though most people think they should be done away with. And the last one is one that's been in the newspapers today, and this is an idea you could use for your current event journal, is... Uh, state drug laws and federal drug laws. Uh, the states of California, Oregon, Washington, and Colorado have now legalized uh, the sale and uh, use of marijuana. But a federal law says this is against, um, still against the law. The federal law is supposed to have supremacy um, in this regard, but in terms of enforcement, this is a major, major hot button issue. An example of how the federal and state governments will battle over, over rights and who's got control of a situation. This is a great uh, breakdown of 
the separation of powers between the three branches of government, not states and federal government, but between the judicial and executive and legislative branch. And it's very useful to, to take a note of this. All right, now we're moving on to civil liberties, and this will be quick. Um, civil liberties are protections of citizens from improper governmental action. They are to restrict the government's jurisdiction. You know, they just try to limit collective action that hopefully won't devolve into a tyranny of the majority. Pretty much, we Americans, we have rights. And we laid out these rights, and the government cannot take them away. Uh, mainly thinking of the Bill of Rights, uh, of these restraints on government power. Um, and as we'll see, you know, there's lots of these Bill of Rights and civil liberties are battled mostly in the Supreme Court or in the court system. The Ninth Amendment here just says, hey, we got these Bill of Rights, but just because we didn't name something doesn't mean that American citizens don't have a right to it. And think of like a right to privacy for the rights that may maybe not have been on people's consciousness at the, the time of the founding, but have grown. So this is just clearly saying, hey, there could be further rights just because we didn't say them. Now I want to talk about dual citizenship. And this is where we go back to it's talking about federalism, where we are pretty much a citizen of the United States, but we're also a citizen of our state. Concerning the Bill of Rights, actually, the First Amendment is the only amendment that specifically says the Congress refers to the federal government, Congress, shown it make no law. Um, the other amendments usually either don't say quite that or they say no person. But it was widely interpreted that the Bill of Rights had to do with limiting the federal national government. And there was an early um, court case, Barron versus Baltimore, which solidified the understanding that the Bill of Rights was a restriction on the federal government, but not the state governments. In other words, you know, you're a dual citizen. You're a citizen of the United States, but you're also a citizen of the state you're in, and that they have different protections. So in the case of Barron versus Baltimore, uh, someone had their property taken away without um, due process, without getting paid appropriately for it. Um, this would go against the Bill of Rights, but it would not go against um, the state government if they did not have the same. So it was ruled in the state's favor. But this would change, uh, specifically with the 14th Amendment, which happened right after the Civil War and had to do with about giving rights to the former slaves. But it was very broad, and it said all persons born or naturalized in the United States are citizens of the United States and the state where they reside. And that no state shall make or enforce any law that shall abridge the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, and property without due process of law. So this would slowly be surely be used to expand the Bill of Rights to not just the federal government's restrictions, but to also restrict st state governments. And you could see this through various cases getting broken down from the amendments on 2nd through 10. Uh, you think of uh, Miranda rights, you know, a right to a, a grand jury, the right to be kept from cruel and unusual punishment, excess bail, um, the right to um, an attorney, these would all be expanded to not to be part of federal cases, but to be part of state um, state restrictions. All right, so that's real quick, civil liberties and federalism. Please continue to read the rest of the slides as there is much more. Thank you.